Testing, testing. All right, so I've learned a lot and I haven't documented it a lot. So in this video, I got a big commit I'm about to make, but before I make it, I'm gonna look uh, through the git diff and we're gonna look at it together and I'm just going to talk about what it is that I've learned. So one of the first things I learned was about this variable called fill rate and how it's kind of a bunch of BS because um, I'm thinking about stereo first of all but basically what the fill rate was supposed to be is what it says up here number number of audio buffers per second and there is this discrepancy between what an audio buffer is and in order to discover what this discrepancy is, um, we need to look at the SDL callback, the audio callback in SDL, which you you um, create, you know, what's called an what's an SDL audio spec variable structure, and you tell it how many sample frames are in it you know sample frames and a sample frame is the size of the sample which in my case is a signed 16-bit integer the number of audio channels which is two for stereo um, and that's that's it right there so if I say I have 512 um, sample frames in my audio buffer it means I have 512 times 2 because um, the size of a 16-bit integer um, is 2 2 bytes because this all gets this all gets converted um, into SEL in number of bytes so that was 512 times 2 and then times another 2 because we're doing stereo so we're doing two channels and then you end up getting 4,096. So 512 times 2 is 1,024, and then 1,024 times 2 is um, 4,096. 4, so then there's also the sample rate. So I'm using a sample rate right now of 32,000 hertz meaning 32,000 times a second, or 32,000 samples a second. So what happens is if we have an audio buffer that's go going into the SDL callback, um, it's coming in with 4,096 bytes, which is actually 512 sample frames. Um, Um, the fill rate is how many times does that audio buffer have to get filled per second? So the discrepancy was this program is talking about a fill rate, but it didn't really specify was this a stereo fill rate? Is it based on sample frames or is it based on bytes? And all you know, there that wasn't very well described. But basically, if we have 512 sample frames, which is stereo f sample frames, um, we want to see how many times it will take for that to reach 32,000. And that will be the fill rate per second. Because we process 32,000 samples a second. So what we would do, and so another thing I want to let you know is that the, the audio callback will process the stereo samples together. Um, so the number of, of callbacks is stereo, when we're in stereo. So let me just... We have like 32,000 
samples a second, and we're doing 512 a call, right? This is stereo again, meaning that it would take 62.5 calls a second. That's so our fill rate is 62.5. Um, yeah, that's our fill rate. 62.5 calls a second, calls to the fill, fill the buffer. Remember that's a, that's stereo because our, our, our fill buffer function takes it in stereo. So we don't have to see originally this, this music player init function was actually multiplying the sample rate times two because it was trying to think in the audio buffers as monaural and that, but no. We're, I'm just keeping it all in stereo, especially since the fill buffer function does it in stereo as well. All right, so you can see how that was a brain fuck, but we got through it, and basically I've I've made things a little clearer. Like I have now a variable instead of fill rate, this is stereo buffs per sec. This is how many how many stereo buffers get filled per second. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's right, but I'd like to take another look at it. Yeah. But yeah, that's all right. Just gonna have to take my word for it. Um, next up is the reason why I was messing with this fill rate stuff is because. I was getting some clicks and pops on, oddly enough, only one song. Uh, I was listening to some Mario Kart songs and they found fine. But when I listened to Star Fox intro track, I was getting uh, clicks and pops. And what I discovered was, so first of all, the, the sample frame size has to be set at a power of two. And... The old fill rate was weird because you would specify a fill rate you wanted and then it would fall in the boundaries of a power of two sample frame size. The thing that I didn't like about it is be, is that if I was getting clicks and pops, right? First of all, I remember reading somewhere that if you're getting clicks and pops, you want a bigger audio buffer. But that wasn't the case for me. I needed a smaller audio buffer. <laughs> so go figure. But but what I didn't like about the old fill rate variable was that it wasn't clear um, how many fills a second I need to set to make the power of two increase. So what what I'm changing now is that um, the, in the in the GUI you're gonna be able to set the sample frame size. I mean um, in powers of two instead of having to like try to go for a certain sample for uh, you know sample stereo buffs a second value and hope that it changes your power of two sample frame size. No, see that's crap. So yeah, you'll be actually being able to change the powers of two. So the options would be something like 512, 1024, 2048, etc. up to you know, some sort of appropriate maximum. And then I mean, the user should be able to type in uh, their own value if they want something that's not in the list. But I can tell that due to my laziness, uh, I won't be providing that user input um, option there. I'm just going to have a suitable range of power of two values. All right, so probably starting with 512, but maybe lower. I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, yes, to get rid of the clicks and pops, I had to get a smaller sample frame size, meaning that the buffer um, function, the buffer filling function, will be called a lot will be called more times a second um, yeah I'm not sure why it is the case my guess is that um, a lot of time must have been spent I guess inside of the APU emulator and not actually getting the, the sounds I don't know but for some reason yeah had to turn the buffer size down and then the clicks and pops went away now before I discovered that the fill rate was the problem, I thought maybe 
the problem is that I'm actually interfacing with the APU um, from another thread, the, my main thread. The APU runs in the uh, audio callback thread, and I and you're supposed to actually stop the the the, the sound or like stop the, uh, the callback before you interface with the emulator from the main thread. But I wasn't doing that, and everything was still working, so I never bothered. And there's a there's a possibility of introducing clicks and pops by doing that. I mean, probably not because it's happening at such a fast rate. But um, I did add in the ability the the ability to stop it and start it when we're interfacing with the APU from the main thread. However, I commented out these changes once I discovered that the real problem was the fill rate. So I commented out these changes because once again, I don't have problems doing this stuff from the main thread I, I just if anything maybe it should be uncommented for the right routines right but once again I haven't incurred any noticeable issues with this so I'm just gonna leave it but yeah I probably should stop it right and then start it when I'm gonna write to it I'm gonna do that it's probably the right way to go about this I don't like changing things that when things seem to be working okay as they are, but I'll go ahead and change that. I'm only going to do this for the write routines. The read ones, you know, that's okay. You can read stuff from other threads, I think. <laughs> I'm not, shit, don't quote me on that. You know what? Let's just Let's just do it the right way. This is the right way. But I am interested to know, like, Yeah, I'm taking it way too seriously. Now this is with the sound stops. And I'm hearing some clicks and pops. Um, you know, I'm just going to go back to how I have it without it. Because like I said, it works, and I won't be getting those clicks and pops. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it like that, and we'll see, guys. We'll see. I mean, I guess it is a concern, you know. You shouldn't be uh, writing. I think, I think reading's okay, probably, if it's an atomic operation. Actually, reading's probably okay, isn't it? I don't really know. Like, can you get garbage data by reading from a separate thread when the other thread's writing? Anyways, like, once again, not worrying about this because it hasn't posed itself a problem in the entire time I've spent on this application, which is like, a couple, I don't know, a couple months at this point, so. Moving forward, let's go back to the git diff.
All right, here's another thing I, I did that I want to talk about. Um, I was having a problem with the, specifically on the Star Fox intro track, when it ended, it would just, the program would stop responding for a good, like, five seconds until the track changed, and the track should just change. And the problem had to do with me calling the fade-out routine from the load file. This is all music player class. And um, I found that if I, if I added a second to the length for the set fade, that the problem could be um, resolved. And I made a comment here that explains everything that I ran into. And I think the, the... Oh, and I did some debugging with GDB. I learned how to debug threads, different threads in GDB. So I was looking at the audio callback, and yeah, the APU emulator was, it was not exiting the fill buffer function. It was spending its sweet ass time in, in the APU emulator play nest of functions. And once again, this is how I resolved it, just by doing this little fix here. But what I think the problem was is that um, the end of the track arrived and then when the when the track length is, is found, which correlates to the setting of the fade, I guess it does something in the emulator and it just doesn't want to leave. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that. This stuff I added here, which is in the the highest audio callback function, which is called STL callback, I added some things to make sure, give me a report on the buffs a second, the amount of stereo samples processed, because I just, I was under trying to understand all that stuff at, at, at one point or another. I did change the audio format from the systems signed 16-bit form to an explicitly um, little Endian signed 16, because I, cause I you know, that's the SNES format. I think it should be explicitly set. Although I'm not sure if that's required or not. I'm thinking it is. Because we send that, we send those samples directly to the APU. Oh, I had the implementation of these functions in the header file of music player class. So I put them in the implementation file. I added this variable, um, stereo buffs per second to the music player. Oh, um, so in order to create a window, I, I, you know, I have my special window objects now. If you want to create a window and have it hidden off the bat, there's just a flag for that. It's probably STL window hidden, I think. I can't see it. I'm not going to check. It's window stuff I don't really want to talk about right now. Something I do want to talk about, really important, is that if you have a, a class, like I have this class called Experience, and the name is very misleading, but it basically has three virtual, pure virtual functions pure meaning there's no implementation in the experience class itself and these functions are called run draw and receive event and what's really cool is that if I have this struct window here inherit from the experience class and I don't define a draw or, or uh, any of the three functions you know any one that I don't define here in window if I define it in a class that inherits from window, for instance, options window, then when I cast options window class um, t to a window of type window, I actually can call windows draw or receive event function and it'll call the option windows function since there was none defined in window, there, there's somehow the appropriate 
constructs in C++ that it'll actually go to the child uh, implementation of that function. So I thought that was really cool because that's exactly what I wanted. It's like go fish. Uh, I'm trying to get access to the debugger. Actually, I was wrong. I think I may have been wrong. See, I'm not really sure what's going on. See, I have a window map class. Um, we're, right now we're getting into the window management that I've implemented, but I have a window map class in the debugger, which is uh, an array of pointers to windows. Really, it's an array of pointers Yeah, to windows. That's right. So, um, I pass in the address of options window into window map. And I think what's actually happening is that options window it just yeah it happens to have the implementation of those functions so it can be ex those can be executed and it, it's cool because they're executed as type option window it's so cool anyway I thought that was really cool because I can be abstract and just deal with windows even though I have these subclasses with different implementations of the receive event function and the draw and the the run and so that's cool so now I'm in I want to talk about the window management but it's a lot so first I'm going to finish the git diff so I've, I've added a bool that I don't even think I use is focused to the window class let me see if I even use it all right let's talk about it we Everything happens in the debuggers handle events class. This is the first set of event parsing that happens. And um, we look at w a window event type. And when we're looking at window events, we're looking at these two. Th this is how I deal with my window. And actually, there's these three. So we got the window event focus lost which I don't even seem to be using at this moment. And then we've got the window event focus gained. So I've already told you that I have this high level uh, map of windows here, which is just an array of, of window stars. And I have subclasses of the window class that does like specific things that I can still command from this window map fortunately and when I construct my debugger I, init I initialize the I just kinda do this real time and I, I optionally set one of them to null in case that'll help in, in determining the end of the list I pass the uh, Option. This is my only sub window I have so far in the project. Um, let's talk about what happens like when I open up a window. I can I can hit this options here, and a new window will get opened, and the old window will still be processing even when I'm in this new window. But we can I have debugs that let me know that I'm actually in the options window, receive event function. Now that function got called from the window map, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, here I am. When I switch to this window, um, we will no longer be parsing these uh, option window receive event functions. As you can see, that stopped until I regain focus, then you'll see it. There it goes. So that's cool. Um, and then you can close the window, and then you immediately get focus back on this window. 
Well, you can open it up again and you can... Now here's the kicker. If I have this window open and I close this, the app will close. And that actually takes special parsing in the event loop um, when you have multiple windows because unlike when you have one window with an SDL quit event gets thrown or pushed, right? But when you have multiple windows, you actually have to parse for the window close event. And then when you get it on your main window, your main app window, you want to you want to push an event of SEL quit. See, that's what I'm doing. So, um, how how does all that work? I'm gonna make an, uh, another video about this. I know that this video is probably getting long, and I talked mostly about um, the fill rate stuff and the stereo buffer fill, and you know, just that discrepancy of knowing what exactly is being represented by the number um the count number in in the fill buffer i i wish i had talked more about that but we we basically nailed it um well we should go back i want to talk about the sdl audio i uh, see i'm saving the window management function for another video all that window management stuff for another video, yeah. I'll just make it right after this and upload it. So we have to find the audio. So when you, well, geez, there's a lot of stuff going on with audio. I wish I had talked about. Um, well, basically, there's a new set of functions in SDL2 where you can actually open specific output devices. For instance, on my computer, I'm using Soundflower, and I have the regular built-in output. These are, so that's a couple output devices I have. And I can open certain ones. But to talk about that is like, holy crap, that's talking about a lot of stuff. But I should make a video about that stuff too. So, all right. Um, I basically know what I'm about to do. I'm going to make a video about how to do that. <laughs> I'm going to try. All right, I'm out.